Mortal Kombat is one of the most notorious video game franchises for several reasons, you know why. MK and other games like Doom really ushered in a more mature era for gaming. It was partially responsible for the formation of the ESRB. That Supreme Court hearing is hilarious today. Blood splatters from the contestants' heads. If only they knew what it was like now. But also, Mortal Kombat is one of the most successful and highest selling series of all time. It is the best selling fighting game franchise and frankly, it's not even close. Like countless other kids, I wasn't allowed to play these growing up, but you can bet I was sneaking quarters into the arcade cabinets and malls anytime I could, then getting bodied by some 14-year-old with a mustache into a stage fatality. You know how it is. From the arcade original all the way to MK1, multiple movies, some great, some not, Mortal Kombat's popularity is evergreen, which of course means there's gonna be imitators. And when it comes to clones, Mortal Kombat might have the most. Fighting games were were nothing new, but this more hyper-violent version of them was an instant hit, causing every publisher and their grandmas to hop on the trends. Digitized sprites, cheesy theming, gotta have it, blood and guts. Even if it looks really stupid, you know it. In the 90s, Mortal Kombat had a crazy amount of clones, rip-offs, and heavy inspirations, so I've gone through and played as many as I can, even the ones that'll make you want to rip your eyes out. Look, all I'm saying is maybe the Atari Jaguar isn't a good console for fighting games. Now, let's hit up our friends and dress them up as a vaguely ninja-looking thing. It's time to look at some clones. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be diving into the often forgotten world of Mortal Kombat clones. I'm actually surprised we haven't done this one yet, considering like, alongside Doom, it's where the word clone kind of originates from. A staggering amount of these came out around the same time as the original three releases, and nowadays, NetherRealm are basically the only ones doing this sort of thing. Which is a shame, because I'd love to see more video games with AAA movie budgets. What's the first Mortal Kombat clone you played? You know, the one where you're taking a look at it and you're like, huh. This looks familiar. Let me know down below and hopefully I get to it. We're gonna be doing a lot of punching and kicking around some of the jankiest and maybe even worst video games that the entire industry has to offer, but we're doing it in style because today's video has been sponsored by Holzkern. So here's some different watches are always gonna be in style, and Hull's current selection is something I really like. Rather than going full metal or, you know, using plastic, they use a combination of natural elements of woods and stone to create a super unique yet classic look. As a kid, I was always running around donning a cheapo toy watch with a cartoon character I probably liked on it, so something like Hull's current watches here are a big step up. Look, sometimes we need the time quickly, and I think the wrist flick is the coolest way to do it. I really like this one in particular, the Encore. It's made of koa wood and marble, and it looks great in just about any outfit that I slap on. They come shipped in a nice looking container that screams, hey, this is quality. Each piece has that natural look and feel that'll end up being unique due to grain and marbling. Holzkern is a newer and leading brand for wooden watches and jewelry in Europe. And their whole thing is creating these things only using natural materials like wood, stone, mother of pearl, naturally unique and uniquely natural. That love extends to jewelry as well, which includes bandelets, rings, necklaces, and even sunglasses. Holzkern's always making new designs too, over a thousand different ones since they started in 2016, so there's bound to be something you'll love. Something like this is a perfect gift for the upcoming holiday season. You can get started early, and you could do so using a discount on me. Head on over to Holzkern's website and use the code AUSTIN15 to save yourself 15% off the entire shop. It's the perfect gift for friends, family, loved ones, or hey, yourself. Thanks to Holzkern for the sponsor, but for now, back to your regularly scheduled Mortal Kombat-ing. Frankly, there's a ton of these. Once Midway's original was flooding arcades left and right, everyone wanted a piece of that bloody pie. Now before we start digging down into the barrel of obscurity and pull out stuff that's better left there, I think we need to start with some of the more obvious ones, maybe even some of the classics, like Primal Rage. What happens when you make a gory fighting game but don't want to compete directly with Mortal Kombat? You get Primal Rage, the stop motion animation fighter with giant monkeys, dinosaurs, and various other creatures. Like what if Rampage World Tour was more dire? Primal Rage successfully took a lot of concepts from Mortal Kombat. They created sprites using real world assets. They had them looking like little 3D models. They even had finishers, a concept we'll be seeing a lot today. By using creatures instead of humans, Atari was 
able to keep things true to that violent style while keeping a T rating, which I think was a big boon for Primal Rage and why it was gonna get ported to every console imaginable. You could practically play this on anything. No, you can probably ignore the Game Gear version. However, none have come close to the arcade original, which has yet to be emulated perfectly due to some wacky copy protection that they incorporated. Most of the ports pale in comparison, not just visually, but with the gameplay too. It's just missing that oomph that I guess you'll just need a quarter to get, or spending several thousand on a cabinet. As a game, I think Primal Rage holds up well. The characters are cool, it's got a technicality to it that you can't mash your way through. Also, it's like hard to not love a game where you can play as two T-Rexes fighting each other. Despite selling allegedly a good amount and getting tie-in merchandise, the sequel, Primal Rage 2, ended up being canceled for mass release with the only cabinet being at Galloping Ghost Arcade in Illinois. It's a bit of a spectacle and you could see potential for a franchise, but I guess Atari and Midway didn't, and that all ended in the 90s. Almost like Killer Instinct. Developer Rareware of Donkey Kong Country fame wasn't known for their fighting games at this time, but in 1994 they would release cult hit Killer Instinct, which would then make its way to the Super Nintendo with the greatest album of all time, Killer Cuts. You just know that this was played at a prom without anyone noticing, except one kid. He knew. Killer Instinct 1, 2, and Gold are what happen when you have clear roots in something and then evolve with them. The original is very obviously in love with Mortal Kombat. The no mercy finishers you could pull off were brutal. People were bleeding all over the place. And then it got ported to the Super Nintendo where the finishers were so tame in comparison to the competition. The gameplay f though. Anytime I hear that ultra combo, it's a good day. Naughty Dog's Way of the Warrior is also very close. We just talked about that in last week's video, so bad it's good, because even though this thing is janky as hell, it's got a lot of charm. Plus, if you're a Rob Zombie fan and all you want to listen to while playing a video game is White Zombie, you literally cannot pick a better thing to play. Maybe keep the 3DO in the closet and whip out an emulator instead, though. Clay Fighter is an obvious pick, too, as it's essentially a parody. It's a uh, lacking in the gore department, but has the same visual charm that Primal Rage does while enjoying a healthy amount of that 90s weirdness. Clay Fighter also got a few sequels like Tournament Edition, 63 and a Third, and then the Sculptor's Cut, which was an elusive blockbuster exclusive. Was it good? Uh, no. But they do have Claytalities, which are a clear parody of Fatalities, meaning that you can goopy murder someone with guest characters like Earthworm Jim or Booger Man? Yeah, I guess he's here. Good old interplay. The Nintendo 64 ones aren't great, although the Tournament Edition is always fun to bust out with some of your weirder friends. Everything so far has been pretty vanilla and that needs to change right now. Coming out a mere month after Mortal Kombat would be Time Killers, and I know what you're thinking, you can't develop a video game in a month, but you can poach an actor to promote the follow-up. Time Killers and its spiritual sequel, Bloodstorm, are two of the most obvious Mortal Kombat clones out there. Heck, Bloodstorm was advertised and heralded as a potential Mortal Kombat killer, which is hilarious in hindsight. Actor Daniel Fasina, the body and face of world famous Johnny Cage, has switched to Bloodstorm, the fighting game for real fighters. All I need now is the WCW Nitro theme to start playing, and we got ourselves a promo. Both of these were developed by Incredible Technologies, whose other big release would be the American American Gladiators NES game, which doesn't bode well, and obviously Time Killers was its own thing. Rather than focusing on fireballs and teleporting kicks, Killers had you using weapons and your limbs. You'd combine buttons to do attacks with like both arms in order to swing your weapons down harder. Which brings us to the main mechanic, dismembering. You got a limb, it's gotta go. No arms, press the punch button to spurt out some blood. It's like Samurai Showdown and Bushido Blade, but before either of those. If you decapitate someone, it's an instant win. You can also do that at the very start of a round, which I found out the hard way. Oof. Time Killers is most infamous for the fact that it kind of sucks, but also the genuinely terrible Genesis port that came out four years later. It's got the spirit of Mortal Kombat violence, but take out the camp and replace it with the worst of 90s art styles. The sprite work and the variables with the limbs getting chopped off is high effort, but man is this one ugly. The sequel is where things get more interesting. This is the one for real fighters after all, Mr. Johnny Cage said so, and was also never Johnny Cage again. Bloodstorm was released in the post-Mortal Kombat world where everyone was trying to out-gore each other. So how would they top that? Ah uh, yeah, that's right, edginess. 
They wanted Bloodstorm to be a big deal for people. It just also kind of sucked. We do have a plot this time. The mighty emperor was assassinated, and so all of the leaders of the world send a fighter to determine the next one. Hmm, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not sure if I'd trust Fallout here with the nuke codes. That's it though, just dudes and dudettes fighting to be the next top guy, all with time traveling and mass amounts of gory dismembering. While it is a vast improvement to time killers, it leaned heavier into those systems as opposed to going for a more modern Mortal Kombat 2 or Street Fighter solution, it manages to feel dated. In 1994, you could be playing Tekken or Darkstalkers, and one glance at this is a huge step down. But hey, in those games, you can't do this. Ah, who wanted more spaghetti? Bloodstorm is crazy violent, but in a way that becomes annoying. I do like the idea of disabling buttons based on where you get hit, but Bloodstorm feels like they were only trying to out-violence Mortal Kombat and give the Supreme Court a round two, as opposed to making a good game. It reaches elf and lead levels of blood, where you start rolling your eyes, and that is not something you want out of your fighter. As you can probably guess, Bloodstorm wasn't a huge hit. The console versions of it were cancelled, and the publisher Strata went out of business. But when you want to be a Mortal Kombat killer and MK2 knocks it out of the park half a year prior, there's not much you can do. It had some good ideas. I love the limb based buttons and the fact that you can get like armless victories, but it felt a day late and a torso short. I'm glad they can grow back at least. It got better. Shout out to Mirage's ending where she wins and enslaves every man on the planet. Like that one Futurama episode. I'm scaroused. Bloodstorm is uh, unfortunate, so I think we should move on to a few games that I thought were pretty good, actually. I'll tell you right now, there's two consistents with these Mortal Kombat clones. One, most of them are terrible, and two, most of them share the same two or three words in the titles. We had Bloodstorm, how about Blood Warrior? Blood Warrior is ridiculous. Made by Kaneko, it was a rare Japanese arcade take on a very Western style of fighter. It's also technically a sequel to Shogun Warriors, but you can literally see the direction they went in. When Capcom was making Street Fighter, Kaneko was looking towards the hyperviolence, and what we got was something that falls firmly between the two designs. The story? Don't worry about it. And by that, I mean there's nothing. There's no attract screen story. There's not even an ending. You're here for one thing and one one thing only, violence. Blood Warrior feels a lot smoother than some of its contemporaries. You've got various ninjas, samurais, and even a kappa to play as. You smack someone and they bleed all over the dang place. Seems about right. There's a neat system where you charge up a meter by blocking and not using specials in order to use stronger versions of them. Small chain? Nah, big chain. Then of course at the end of every battle it's time to finish them, and rather than having to remember a combination on the fly, you just press one of your attack buttons. Sure, there's not much variety, but wow, that is a lot of blood. Honestly, my favorite part of this is the high quality photos they put on the fight transitions. Like, oh my god, Sampai looks ridiculous. How is this goofy looking Power Rangers thing where you can see the folds of his costume in a game so absurdly violent? I don't know, but I like it. Gross. Blood Warrior wasn't that successful, and it never got a sequel, but it wasn't Kaneko's last fighting game. I do think it's pretty good, so I personally want to see a follow-up, and thankfully the following year, in 1995, they would release their next big hit and another Mortal Kombat clone, <clears throat> the Kung Fu Master Jackie Chan. No, I'm not joking. I'm Jackie Chan, this is my game. <laughs> Yo, which Jackie you playing as? Kung Fu Master and its updated version, Fists of Fire, are two real video games that were really in arcades, and they were also the last fighters that Kaneko would ever make. Kind of evolving on some of the concepts from Blood Warrior, Jackie Chan continues to lean into the Mortal Kombat style of movement, as well as finishers. Although, considering this was using the likeness of a real-world person, those finishers are sadly tame as heck. I hope John Cena knows what he's getting into. I think the most interesting thing about this game is, honestly, the fact that it only happened happened because Jackie Chan was looking for sponsors for his film, Thunderbolt. Like, we'll sponsor the film if you let us make a game with you, shake on it, do some digitizing, and call it a day. Also, you can't actually defeat any of the three Jackies. If you knock them down, they just get back up and are like, <laughs> nice one, champ, like Goku. Except busted, because you can never truly win. Kaneko fighters sure are something special. <laughs> As I'm sure you're already noticing, a vast majority of these Mortal Kombat clones consist of two words and three to six syllables. Primal Rage, Time Killers, Blood Warriors, and that's not gonna change much. Although we're moving from the arcades into the living room with the Sega Genesis and CD for Eternal Champions. Two words, 
six syllables. Eternal Champions was a big deal when it came out. It was Sega's answer to Mortal Kombat. It was trying to set up a big universe with characters from different points in time. The Eternal Champion predicts that mankind's gonna die out, so he holds a tournament in order to bring a mighty warrior back to life and hopefully restore the fate of the universe. So like, almost the same as Time Killers, Mortal Kombat, and everything in between. Let's just hope that you got the Genesis six button pad. Eternal Champions is a six button fighter with complicated combos for the time, and if you only only have old faithful three butts, you'd need to press start to switch between sets. Disgusting, I know, but we did what we had to back then. It feels a bit dated now, but Eternal Champions was awesome. The character selection had a nice variety, and I was always fond of playing as Jonathan Blade. I mean, look at him. As a kid, he might as well have just been Blade dressed as a Green Lantern. Those shades are so sick. The Genesis version here was a little light on the hyper-violence and gore, but that didn't stop it from making big sales. Enough to get a sequel on the Sega CD, Eternal Champions challenge from the dark side. A couple more syllables, I know. Kick out that Genesis sound chip, it's time for CD audio and 3D 90s CG cutscenes. The original Eternal Champions was rated MA13, because Sega had their own thing back then, but you'll notice the box for Dark Side's got a big fat M on it. This came out shortly after the ESRB was formed, and it is very much M-rated. Trade in that lack of gore for all of the gore. Referred to as overkills and sudden deaths in this, we've got full freaking cutscenes stopping the action, and and fading to different areas. This is like a modern Mortal Kombat stage transition level of over the top. These overkills were really difficult to pull off because you needed certain characters to be in certain levels and parts of the map. But when you did it, it was always a showstopper. And I mean that for real, you got the mafia doing multiple drive-bys on you as your friend is just sitting watching you get humiliated slow burn style. People look at Eternal Champions these days and are probably slightly underwhelmed, but the Sega CD version of this is really where it's at. But only if you play with a friend. The AI on this thing is broken. It's clearly reading inputs and you'll get bodied in seconds. What the heck? Is that little V? Eternal Champions was set up to be a franchise and I think it would have knocked it out of the park. It even got two spinoffs using some of the memorable characters with Chicago Syndicate and experts even if they, they weren't very good. However, a third mainline release for the Saturn got canceled by Sega in what has to be one of the dumbest self-sabotage moments of all time. Allegedly, thinking that it would cloud the Japanese site's push for Virtua Fighter as the premier Sega fighting game, they shut down the entire thing. It even got blocked from Netfighter on Heat.net. They went full hog on being haters. And that is a massive shame. The idea of a fighter using characters from different periods of time, each having their own stage, is dope. But unfortunately, if you want to play as Mr. Chicago himself, Larson Tyler, you'll need to whip out the old Sega CD. Also, we should never forget about that time Eternal Champions had a crossover with Archie Sonic comic. 48 pages of kick in action. What, could they not say but? Clown behavior. Sorry, I lied. There is one more game that you can play as a Chicago man, but for that we're gonna need to leave the top of the mountain and go straight to the bottom of the barrel. And that's where you're gonna find 3DO exclusive Shadow War of Succession. One of the worst things I've ever played. You killed me once. But now I am more powerful than you can ever imagine! Shadow War of Succession is a fighter for the 3DO, meaning we got two 3DOs in one video. Let's go. It was heralded as one of the worst games of all time, as early as the 90s with gaming mags. But why? Oh, yeah, okay, I understand. I love this two frames a second CGI intro of a helicopter flying by the Statue of Liberty before we get the story crawl, which is essentially something happened and we're not sure why. The manual tells us that the Shadow King was assassinated and now a bunch of people have to fight to become the next one. I'm sensing a trend. Kind of like they forgot to include a story and just whipped one out at the last second, which I guess makes sense considering they included a prompt for fatalities to occur, but completely forgot to put any of those in either. Shadow War of Succession is a Mortal Kombat clone so bad it makes me retroactively resend negative opinions for other games. One look at the gameplay here and you can just see what I'm talking about. It has the visual appearance of something familiar but feels dreadful. The screen is constantly shaking and I'm just unsure that any of my attacks are landing. I don't think I won more than a single bout in my time playing because it's just that busted. But I'm glad the final boss, the Shadow King, looks just like Silver Surfer with a belt on.
fun. There's a little bit of lore in the instruction book, some of which makes very little sense, and anytime I look at Viper's little cutout, I can't help but laugh. Not much is known about Viper, he just kinda shows up. Some say he is the angel of death. Yeah, this little weasel. Ah! Shadow War for Succession is the bottom of the barrel, but there's still other terrible Mortal Kombat clones to get into, just bad in different ways. One of the most notorious being Atari Jaguar exclusive, Kasumi Ninja. You better get ready to do 20 button combos on the controller equivalent of a TI-89 graphing calculator. Except who am I kidding, it's five inputs at best. If you don't know it, Kasumi Ninja is the one with the Scottish dudes shooting a fireball out of his kilt. Something you really ought to go to the doctor for. It's also a game that has some of the weirdest control decisions I can think of. In order to do a special, you have to hold down the C button, do the input, and then release. There's only three attacks, punch, kick, and special, but you're only gonna make it through fights spamming projectiles that the AI is too stupid to block. The story has you attempting to defeat the evil demon Gyaku by killing other warriors and absorbing their abilities, which of course means brutal fatalities. Hope you're in the mood for an outdated announcer and fighting mechanics that feel terrible. Kasumi Ninja, despite having a massive ninja on the cover only features two ninjas who are twins. Twinjas. The rest of the cast are ridiculous stereotypes like Akawa, the Comanche chief, Alaric, king of the goths, and Danja, the urban vigilante, who according to the manual is a straight A Harvard Law student that decided to become Batman. Just one not afraid to make you explode. The cast is mostly unmemorable, the combat feels dated and stiff, the story is nothing special, and I don't know about y'all, but I think the Atari Jaguar just might not be a very good con. Console. That is, unless you like listening to a healthy dose of fartcore. There's plenty of that. As we continue scraping the bottom of the barrel, guess what? We've got another Jaguar game, Ultra Vortex. Coming out in 1995, the same year as Mortal Kombat 3 released, Atari teamed up with Beyond Games to give us something that game rankings had listed at a five out of 100. Or you know, a 10 out of 10 from Atari Gaming Headquarters. It's hard to dunk on this one. Allegedly, Ultra Vortex had a tiny budget and was made by a small studio, self-proclaimed as very indie by writer Tim Huntsman, but at the same time, Time, everything here screams tight deadlines and copycats. The story is, once again, a bunch of people fighting for control of some ancient power or artifact, this time Incan flavored. It all seems incredibly uninspired. That is, unless you look through the manual, which comes with several pages of lore. Yeah, remember manuals? You've got long paragraphs about the state of the planet, different factions vying for control, and what exactly the Ultra Vortex is. Look, I don't need long cutscenes, but anything would help me to understand this bizarre character selection. You want normal Mortal Kombat looking humans? Robots? Sure. And then there's Grok. What? It's Grok. When the thing that I remember most from playing your game is the fact that it has a poopality, maybe time's kind of forgotten you for a reason. Not that many people might have known about this in the first place, considering it was a Jaguar exclusive, one going for over $100 complete these days. But uh, don't do that. A lot of the Mortal Kombat clone dregs are samey or don't really have much to talk about. There's Time Slaughter, a DOS shareware release in the mid 90s that was a satirical take on Mortal Kombat. Bloodlust Software was a company made in retaliation towards the movement against violence in video games around that time. And Time Slaughter is exactly what you think it is. Over the top, nonsensical violence. Definitely a time capsule that comes off more edgy these days than anything else. How about Catfight, the ultimate female Female fighting game. You, uh, yeah, you get it. Except I didn't because I couldn't get it to properly run on my PC, no matter how long I tried. Here's what it's supposed to look like. Here's what I got. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's Catfight. Though if I wanted a trashy all-women's Mortal Kombat clone, I could always boot up Bikini Karate Babes. This is like what Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball has conditioned the mainstream audience to think Dead or Alive is. I mean, well, this is a thing. You got your digitized babes doing karate stuff. Who is this for? You know who. But it also got a sequel. One with intro stage panning that reminds me of Soul Calibur. If the love for her family is power, then no one is stronger. One more game at the bottom of the barrel, and we need to move into licensed titles. Mortal Kombat was hot, the movie was hot, and you know that they were gonna be trying to adapt martial arts films into Mortal Kombat clones. And I'm sure we all remember cult classic Expect No Mercy. 
right? You know, the 1995 straight to VHS martial arts film starring Billy Blanks. What? You don't know this one? The story about a bunch of assassins being trained in the virtual arts academy, like VR headsets. The one with green screens and entire fights looking like they take place inside of the Nick Arcade finale. With CGI this advanced in 1995, the moon landing was definitely faked. Expect No Mercy is a perfect B-tier cheesy action film that's fun to watch with friends. Perhaps even so bad it's good, haha. -ha. But in 1996, it would get itself a PC-only tie-in Mortal Kombat clone. Remember earlier when I said that Shadow War of Succession is the worst one of these? Well... <laughs> Expect No Mercy is one of, if not the worst video games I've ever played, and it's not even close. I love that you get actors from the film talking to you on this little handheld device. Oh my god, what's wrong with my hand? Ew. The game follows the same plot, but you're going into the Academy of Virtual Combat Arts. This whole thing looks like a parody, almost like the real version of what Hypnospace Outlaw was satirizing. Oh, and if you're doubting that this is a Mortal Kombat clone, I expect pain, blood, a Mortal Kombat. Well, yeah. And don't forget about these. <laughs> The controls here are so unresponsive, it's practically unplayable. You've only got, as far as I can tell, three usable buttons, and I can't seem to pull off any combos. Not that you'd dream of it, considering this was a Windows 3X release. Not even DOS, you'd better be whipping out Windows ME for this bad boy. The music here is totally bizarre. The animation seems like they were choreographing stuff correctly, but failed to have individual frames centered. Why am I suddenly in a random minigame where I'm clicking on eyes? What's going on? Expect no mercy. Mercy is impressively bad, and it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that the developer, Microform International, is mostly known for 90s shovelware. They did keep making stuff with those digitized graphics though, like Gooch Grundy's X Decathlon. Who is this for? I have no idea, but I'm always rooting for the Gooch. Don't play Expect No Mercy, you won't get any. Especially if you like the ability to hear sound. Well, huh. We need to take it up a notch, but only a little bit. A vast majority of Mortal Kombat clones all came out around the same time as the original, and as the genre began to evolve, they quickly moved away from digitized sprites, and Western-style fighting games also began to become less common. However, the cheesy hyperviolence and gore would continue on, and Mortal Kombat's inspiration would be felt everywhere, even if it was from Midway themselves. Specifically with War Gods and Mace the Dark Age. Mace is what happens when you combine Mortal Kombat with Soul Edge. Each character has a big ol' weapon, the stages have out of bounds areas that'll do damage to you, and you bet your sweet thing there's some fatalities. They aren't even heavily censored on the Nintendo 64, a company that was notorious for doing exactly that to Mortal Kombat. It is still a violent game. Friends, Mace is pretty decent, especially the arcade version. You might even say it was ahead of its time. Mace might have been developed by Atari, but when it hit the Nintendo 64, it was published by Midway, who, I guess, decided to go full hog on Mortal Kombat and the clones because they also put out Biofreaks and War Gods. Biofreaks, that's biological flying robot enhanced armored killing synthoids, aka the entire cast of Bloodstorm, is a 3D fighter. You move around a map a little more freely, kinda similarly to Tech. You have the ability to dismember limbs as well as pull off mutilations, this game's version of fatalities. You can also fly around, shoot some guns, and every character was some form of a freak. Gonna go out on a limb here and say if this is the guy on the front of the cover, none of the cast are merchandisable. When it was released, it was notable for being really good looking, especially as a Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 release. But the fighting doesn't feel great, especially since you have to manually turn around anytime you jump over someone. There there's a reason every good fighting game does that for you. The Stranger Midway Games release is easily War Gods. Coming out in 1996, actually before Mortal Kombat 4, this was Midway's first real attempt at going 3D. Or as the advertising campaign said, 3 defiant, 3 destructive, 3 dimensional. True 3D fighting environment. And if that's not enough 3D for you, hop on over to the arcade cabinet and slap the 3D button. The entire concept of War Gods is blatant. Mortal Kombat in a 3D environment. It actually plays closely to Mortal Kombat 4. Some of the punch and attack animations are really similar. However, all of these systems were severely underbaked, and War Gods ultimately feels, uh, 
sauceless. They continued to use real people as the actors for the characters, but instead had them digitized on the 3D models, and it looks way less impressive. The cast of characters isn't memorable, and talk about underwhelming, the fatalities needed to bake a bit longer. War Gods seems like a game that was cooked up to test the waters more than anything, and it seems like I might be right. The console port is completely lacking in options. There's not even a free versus computer mode. There's no discernible story, no dialogue, no cutscenes, which for 1997 was the wrong call, especially since Hotoke was just around the corner. They were really banking on that 3D button. Never. From here, things get a little more loosey-goosey. It seems like most developers decided to give up on making hyper-violent fighting games and just left it to Midway and the Netherrealm. There was the unreleased Thrill Kill that doesn't feel like Mortal Kombat, but was absolutely inspired by its penchant for violence. This was unfortunately canned due to being the first thing to ever receive an adults-only rating, but it's actually pretty decent, even if you can technically play it as Wu-Tang Shaolin style. Then there's Cardinal Sin, developed by Chronos Digital Entertainment, the people who brought us Criticom and Dark Rift to uh, not good games, Cardinal Sin, unfortunately, wasn't too far from that. Except it's the weird sci-fi setting and replace it with some good old-fashioned dark fantasy CG. Sin is a little closer to Air Guides or Soul Calibur than it is Mortal Kombat in the mechanics. And I actually kind of like playing it. The controls are simple, the juggling combos have a good feel to them, and I think the setting is unique. I'll always go for a D&D themed fighting game. Unless it's the official Dungeons and Dragons fighter, Iron and Blood, Warriors of Ravenloft. However, if we're looking for big murdery fatalities, get ready to also be disappointed. Man, where's the poopality when we need it? Let's shoot forward a generation. The original Xbox actually had a lot of fighting games, but only one of them was created by a studio helmed by one of the original co-creators of Mortal Kombat, 2003's Tao Fang, Fist of the Lotus. I think this one deserves a shout out. It doesn't have fatalities, it doesn't take place on a 2D field, and it's like a seven out of 10 at best, but you can absolutely see a lot of Mortal Kombat's DNA in this. I mean, it even says from the co-creator of Mortal Kombat on the cover. What a cover it is. Yo, you got gingivitis or what? The main reason that this got an M rating without fatalities is definitely the sexuality and bruising mechanics. Rather than dismembering someone, you debuff them by damaging a limb too much, and through the battles, you'll see more bruises on their bodies. Relatively tame today, but in the 2000s, this was like, whoa. The Xbox must be for cool adult gamers only. From here, Western fighting games kind of dropped off the planet. It became this very largely Japanese dominated industry with titles like Street Fighter, Tekken, Guilty Gear, whatever the heck Capcom is putting out. And with rare exception, it's mostly Netherrealm holding on the fort. If you want to find something Western inspired these days, you got to look towards like indies on Steam or in one case, the arcades. Dark Presence is more of a project than a full game. It's a 2D fighter that's been worked on for over 28 years now, boasting over 150,000 frames of animation. It's this passion project that's become so notorious it's gotten its own documentary, Ghost Lord and the Quest for Dark Presence. You look at the gameplay, you know exactly what it's trying to be, and I dig it. There's no telling if this thing will ever officially come out, but I hope it does. Which means the most recent Mortal Kombat clone that I could get my actual hands on, as far as I know, has to be the Terror Drome series, Rise of the Boogeyman and Reign of the Legends. Boogeyman was a free fan-made game featuring a cast of famous horror and slasher film characters. We got Chucky, we got Ghostface, we even got Ash from Evil Dead. Officially? No. But I guess this was popular enough for them to want to create a sequel that they could make money with. Thus, Terradrome Reign of the Legends was born. In early access. The developer, Hurricane Studio, obviously couldn't use those licensed characters, so they filled this game with spin-off versions of them. The famous urban legends, cryptids, and 80s horror mascots. Van Helsing? No. Alex Van Helsing. It? This. We've also got Mr. Hyde, looking 
like an alternate version of Johnny Cage. Terradrome knows what it is, and it rocks it to become probably the only modern Mortal Kombat clone. This is the closest I've seen any game come to that Mortal Kombat 9, 10, 11 territory, and considering it's an early access title, I think it's pretty all right. I do love that half of the alternate colors are just nerdy comic book character color schemes I recognize in a second. You want Frankenstein as Colossus? Also, this ain't MK versus DC. We do have some fatalities in the shape of death sentences, which are still a little limited as of this video, but are what you would expect. I don't have too much to say on Terradrome 2 until it's finished, but uh, where's my royalty-free Ash Williams? Like, Cinder Williams? And now, an ode to the rest. With a lot of these Mortal Kombat clones, there's really not that much to get into, but some of them are still worth shouting out. Tons of companies in the 90s were just throwing stuff at the walls and hoping it would stick, and others are just kind of dipped in the Mortal Kombat sauce. Not, not with the full DNA. Not all of them make a big impression, and some of them are just unreleased ROMs you find on the internet. So let's run through a few, starting with One Must Fall 2097. I'll probably be dead by the year 2097, but that might be okay considering this game, published by Epic of all companies, shows us a dire future with massive fighting robots. One where everyone looks like a how to draw manga character. Also, Jazz Jack Rabbit. 2097 is a DOS fighter, which already bodes well, but one that mixes RPG elements with all of the popular games of the time. Pick your robot, your freaky anime pilot, and get to punch in. We got fatalities in the form of destruction moves. They are, uh, okay, though I don't know who's gonna be playing this with a friend next to them huddled up sharing the same keyboard and be able to pull one of those off. It'll get violent quick. Keeping it early 90s in keyboards, there's also Pray for Death. I think this is a punishment worse than being alive. Welcome to the Souls Chamber, where you get to fight other deceased evil warriors from the multiverse in a battle to maybe get resurrected. <laughs> Dang, the plot's pretty original. Although, who cares when you can perform vicious fatalities and 20-hit combos as Cthulhu. Pray for Death is a lot more of a killer instinct clone than Mortal Kombat, not just in the way that it plays, but also the faux 3D sprite work. You look at the way that Sir Maelstrom's throwing his thing back and you know exactly what you're getting into. I do feel like the fatalities are tame for 1996, but if you feel like picking this up, it's been re-released on Steam, so get ready to see good old Pray for Death in the Evo bathrooms, which is also where you'd find Weapon Lord. MK clone, nah, but it's got fatalities, ones you gotta manually pull off by juggling bodies after winning a round brutal. Twin Goddesses on the PlayStation 1 features a banging soundtrack and also a weird mix of character sprites. You've got like two or three digitized people looking like a 90s tokusatsu and then a bunch of western CDI monsters. Not Mortal Kombat at all, but when else am I going to talk about a game that looks and sounds like this? Survival Arts. Oh my god, Survival Arts. Developed by Scarab, Survival Arts is what happens when you put Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter into a blender and watch what happens. You're playing this goofy fighting game with goofy colorful characters and people are giving cool thumbs up in the backgrounds, then boom, you explode into individual limbs and your intestines are flying everywhere. The character sprites are huge on the screen. Actually, the scaling is some of the biggest I've seen maybe since KOF 12. Survival Arts is pure Kasoge. The story is everything you've seen already, you gotta brave the survival arts tournament in order to learn the mighty secret. You could really tell that everyone was running out of ideas, which makes it funnier that one of Scarab's next games would be Battle Monsters for the Sega Saturn. Another Mortal Kombat clone, just more ridiculous in every manner. Battle Monsters is spoopy Halloween, plus an early rendition of Smash Brothers. You fight in a bigger arena with multiple tiers, you can dash from side to side, and this whole thing is wacky. The AI is weird, and battles will sometimes times be over in 10 seconds, and you can bet your sweet thing it's something I'm gonna bust out at parties. No Frankenstein's monster fatalities or anything, though it does have that 90s digitized live action charm that only really existed in this era. Between the two, play survival arts, between you and me, cherish them both. Which brings us to the very end of the video, the very last of the Mortal Kombat clones, at least I think. And what if I told you we were gonna end with something that was never technically released? For some reason, one of the most notorious ripoffs is something that was never released, but it was so blatant it became popular in its own right. A cult hit? Mm, I don't know about that, but when I asked around, everyone was saying Tattoo Assassins. There's actually a decent amount of unreleased Mortal Kombat clones. Thea Realm Fighters was another Atari Jet 
Jaguar banger that made its way to E3 1995 that wanted you to prepare yourself for real combat. It even featured similar martial artists like Ho Sun Pak, who was Liu Kang and Shang Tsung, as well as others. This one getting cancelled definitely marked the end of the Jaguar life support. Super Combat Fighter was a cool looking Kickstarter that failed to launch, and Death Cargo was a whole weird story about a horror fighting game that may or may not have existed. All of the footage of it has been scrubbed off of YouTube at this point, so I won't risk it, but apparently it was real. I'm sure there's way more I couldn't find and things that never made its way into the public eye, but Tattoo Assassins absolutely did. And if you squint, you'd swear you're just looking at Mortal Kombat. Developer Data East Pinball, yes, you heard that right, a pinball company wanted to compete directly with Midway on this front, and in 1994, failed to release Tattoo Assassins. I'm not really sure why. Way worse Mortal Kombat clones had come out over the years, and this one was about as close as it got. It's just, you know, not as good in every way. Yes, that is a man wearing whitey tidies. Tattoo Assassins takes place in a world where a magic ink, the ink of geese, has the ability to amorphize creatures and magic onto their hosts. So like, you get a crappy tat drawn on you and you become super cool and powerful as heck. A very serious plot with very serious characters like AC Current, Billy Two Moons, Cara Keller, and Truck Davis, brother. This guy's like five degrees away from having a Trogdor on his chest. This very serious plot with very serious characters also has very serious combat. Practically identical to the Mortal Kombat way of doing things. It's not all balanced since it's a prototype, but don't let that stop you from spamming projectiles or uh, doing command farts. Flaming farts even. <laughs> You can definitely tell that this was directed by the guy who was a screenwriter on Back to the Future. I don't actually think Tattoo Assassins is that bad. There are a ton of finishing moves you can do with each character, as there's multiple everyone can do, like Animalities or Mona Lisa's if you want to see your opponent looking all bougie, which I do. The main problem with Tattoo Assassins is that it's frankly dumb as hell and lacking any real innovation. It's like seeing a game that you love, but worse in every way. It's more choppy, it's just not as good as Mortal Kombat. It is like the picture perfect most 90s video game of all time though, and I can't hate on it for that. The atmosphere is on point. You can put this right alongside Redneck Rampage in the category of mid 90s video games featuring way too many farts. I can see why Tattoo Assassins has the notoriety it does, even, even though it kinda sucks. It's totally worth a shot if you find yourself surfing the net one of these days. Remember surfing the internet? Do people do that anymore? I can't believe how easy it is to surf the net. So there you have it. I think that's the entire forgotten world of Mortal Kombat clones. And if I forgot one, well, I'm sorry. I wanted to talk about a few here and there, and before I knew it, I couldn't find any more. And now we're sitting here with a 45 minute video and that's just how it goes. Hopefully that's all the biggest releases and the most notable ones, but I probably missed something that one of y'all will let me know down below in the comments and then I'll have a big cry. But if not, grab your favorite and least favorite friend, boot a blood warrior and have yourself a good time or war gods if you're feeling spicy. Seriously, I feel like bloody war and time were in the titles of like half of these games. I guess if I'm gonna make myself my own Mortal Kombat clone, I'm gonna name it like Bloody War Time, the Jackie Chan experience. If you like today's video, check out the sponsor Holes Kern. It really helps out the channel and I think they've got a lot of good stuff. Or if you wanna support more directly, you can head over to the Patreon where you can pledge monthly. You can buy a t-shirt over on the Pixel Empire, drop a comment, a like down below, subscribe. And I can tell I'm getting old because some of the things y'all write make me feel like my bones are turning into dust. Also, hey, hello. It's been 10 years since I started my channel. This video ended up being the 10 year anniversary video and I couldn't think of a better one to do it on. Weird games, bad games, clones, all the Kisoge in the world and everything that we've built up over the last decade and 275,000 subscribers. It's ridiculous that we've been going for this long and have gotten this far and I'm just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have traded for the world. I'll be putting out a few more videos in September to celebrate before taking a little vacation on my end and well, I hope y'all enjoy them and here's to another 10 years. Anywho, I've been Austin and this accidentally became one of my longest scripts to date. Catch me next time when we make the most me video possible. And also leave a video suggestion in the comments cause I'm gonna try to flip it into a full video in the next two weeks. Personal challenge, do it. 
Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, David Molnar, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Idlevice, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arter, Nick Irving, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for the generous support. For the whole month of September to celebrate my tenure, all of the patrons are going to be in the credits, in case things seem a little longer. And again, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot thank y'all enough. I don't have too much to say that hasn't already been said. Keep your eyes peeled out for more stuff over the next year. If there's one thing you can bet on from me, is that I like video games too much to ever stop this train. Be kind to each other, thank you for your continued support, and go, go, go play a video game. But first, take a shower. You need it.